Welcome to the Social Learning Amplified podcast, the podcast that brings us candid conversations with educators who are finding new ways to engage and motivate their students inside and outside the classroom. Each episode of Social Learning Amplified will give you real-life examples and practical strategies you can put into practice in your own courses. Let's meet today's guest. Welcome to Social Learning Amplified. I'm your host, Eric Mazur, and our guests on the episode today are Dr. Lauren Barbeau and Dr. Claudia conejo Happen. Thank you both for joining. Thank, Thank you for having us. us. Lauren Barbeau is the Assistant Director of Learning and Technology Initiatives at the Center for Teaching and Learning at Georgia Institute of Technology. She earned her PhD in English from Washington University in St. Louis. Before becoming an educational developer, she taught writing and literature courses. Her educational development career at Georgia Southern University and subsequently served as the assistant director for faculty development and the scholarship of teaching and learning at the University of Georgia. Her research interests include teaching with technology as well as documenting and assessing teaching. Claudia Cunejo Happel is an associate director of the Center for Teaching and Learning Excellence at Embry Riddle Aeronautical University in Daytona Beach. She earned her PhD in Spanish from the Ohio State University and an educational specialist degree from Georgia Southern University. Claudia has previously held positions in the University Center for the Advancement of Teaching at Ohio State and the Center for Teaching Excellence at Georgia Southern University. Her researching and assessing teaching, as well as inclusive instructional practices. Now, just two months ago, Lauren and Claudia published a book together entitled Critical Teaching Behaviors Defining, Documenting, and Discussing Good Teaching. I was surprised for our listeners who are interested in this book at the end of this podcast, but don't just jump to the end of the podcast now. <laughs> Lauren and Claudia, your book provides a guide to evidence-based effective teaching and also a framework for assessing and documenting teaching. In the book, you present what you call the critical teaching behavior framework. Can you explain to our listeners what you mean by critical teaching behaviors? Uh, sure, Eric. I'll go ahead and explain that. Um, so the framework itself consists of six research-based categories. So it's align, include, engage, assess, integrate technology, and reflect. And all these are our large, broadly defined categories um, that are behavior-based. So the idea is that they're based on what we can see instructors doing in the classroom or what instructors can provide evidence that they're doing outside the classroom. So the first column of the framework has these categories with the definitions associated with them. The second column has a short list of behaviors that we can see. So they're representative behaviors. The book goes in much more depth with the behaviors. However, on the framework itself, we wanted to create a nice two page overview. Uh, so we kept it short to six representative behaviors. And then the last column actually provides facu faculty with guidance on what sort of documentation they can collect as evidence that they're engaging in these types of behavior. So the framework started off as this project that uh, helps faculty define what good teaching is and what it looks like, providing a common language in which to talk about their teaching. But we eventually expanded beyond just the framework itself and developed tools for peer observations so that faculty can conduct observations of each other's teaching for formative or summative purposes, as well as uh, student feedback forms so that faculty can collect mid-semester student feedback. And the idea is that all of these tools are aligned to the same framework. So when faculty are having these observations conducted or collecting mid-semester feedback, they're then able to write a narrative that is coherent using the framework and the behaviors that we've suggested, as well as the categories to help them find a language to frame what it is that they're doing in their classrooms. I see. So what inspired you to, to create this book? Yeah, thank you for that question. 
So we have seen several institutions who are telling their faculty to be excellent teachers. But then what they are not doing is actually defining what excellent teaching looks like. And so without that definition, it is really hard for faculty to live up to those expectations. And so we really wanted to provide a framework and guidance that was based on evidence and research because there's a lot of research out there on what is effective teaching, what is good teaching, what supports student learning. But faculty don't always have the time, understandably so, to dig into that and really see um, what is it that I need to do to support my student learning? What can I show to the person evaluating me or asking me to demonstrate effective teaching? Um, so the CTP framework is really an attempt to do that, to provide that guidance that is based in research and still is flexible enough to really allow faculty across disciplines to find a way to demonstrate their accomplishments in each one of the, the categories. So for example, if you're teaching physics, you might have one approach to engaging your students, whereas I am teaching Latin American literature and culture, and I might have a completely different way to engage my students. That does not mean one of those approaches is wrong, it's just different. And a lot of times we have frameworks that say, here's a checklist, meet all of the boxes. We want to see them all checked. And so that was really one of the things that inspired us for uh, looking into the research, coming up with a framework that provides flexibility as well as a comprehensive definition of good teaching, and hopefully in that way allow faculty uh, to have a common understanding that they can use to talk about teaching, to demonstrate their teaching effectiveness in a way that is not just, oh, here are some things that I'm doing, but actually here are some things that I'm doing that have been shown to support student learning. And I'll add to that, Eric, that one of the Claudia and I had um, sort of different original motivations that converged on a similar path. Uh, this project for me started off more as how do we help faculty talk about their teaching and present it for documentation and assessment purposes. So we were getting a lot of questions at the time Claudia and I worked in the center together. We were getting a lot of questions from chairs and deans saying, I don't know how to eva evaluate my faculty in a way that's fair based on the size of class they're teaching or the discipline that they're teaching in. Because even within the same college, we have a variety of disciplines that teach differently based on their needs. And so for me, uh, this project really came out of the need to provide some sort of guidance for those who are evaluating faculty, as well as for faculty who are coming to us saying, look, I'm going to be evaluated on my teaching and I need to know how to present that. How do I talk about that in a way that best showcases what it is that I'm doing in my classroom? So the second part of your title refers to good teaching and, and Claudia, you already mentioned, uh, you know, the need to define good teaching. So what is it exactly, if you can give a synopsis of that, that defines good learning? That's a great question, yeah. Eric. Um, so the idea behind the research we conducted was that all of these are practices that have been proven to lead to student success. Now, what's different in each of these studies is how they're defining student success. Now, success might be a four-year graduation rate. It might be lower DFWI rates or higher test scores or a greater sense of belonging. Uh, but in some way, shape, or form, all of the research that we pulled on to create this project defines student success in, in a way that shows that students are moving towards the goalpost of learning. Um, and whatever it is that we're doing in the classroom has been proven to contribute to moving them towards that ultimate goal of learning, uh, although the studies might define that differently. Now, you're both involved in Centers for Teaching and Learning, so I'm sure that this uh, framework, the CTB framework, was around way before you wrote the book. So you've had the opportunity to, to observe faculty in work. Um, what have you found that people are doing with your framework? And to what extent have you been able to observe people implement them? Yeah, that is a great question. Um, so for me at Ember-Riddle, the tool that we have implemented most here is probably the midterm feedback tool. So the midterm feedback is a survey that is facilitated at the middle of the semester. So faculty get 
feedback on how the class is going for their students in the moment rather than waiting until the end of the term. And the tool we are proposing includes both open-ended responses, questions, as well as um, ranking questions that are aligned to the uh, five first categories of critical teaching behaviors. And so we have implemented that here at Ember-Riddle for the last several years. And one of the things that faculty really appreciate is the combination of quantitative and qualitative feedback that they are receiving, especially faculty who are in the STEM disciplines really appreciate the quantitative feedback. We've also done some preliminary data analysis that shows that it has the potential by focusing on those behaviors, concrete behaviors, rather than um, faculty characteristics or course materials. Um, it has the potential to reduce bias, implicit bias in the rankings. That is still an ongoing project, but the, the initial data that we collected seems promising. So that is one way in which um, I have implemented that in my practice here. Lauren, do you want to share a little bit about sure. your experience? Yes. So the first instrument we developed off of this framework, and, and honestly, this was before we ever thought about creating a book, is we'd created this framework and then we said, you know, it would be great is if we had an observation tool that was aligned to this, because then we're giving faculty a more comprehensive guide to talking about and documenting their teaching. Um, so we ended up developing the observation forms and then the protocol for conducting observations because we're only a few people and, and it's useful for faculty to be able to conduct peer observations and not always have to rely on a center for teaching and learning to do that. So we created this and as far as I'm aware, Georgia Southern is still using this protocol to conduct observations. So I think they started using it in um, 2019. Uh, so it's been in, a, in use for about five years now. And what we've seen is that faculty really appreciate the opportunity to see mm -hmm. both individual categories of feedback as well as sort of holistic, where am I big picture? So this instrument works by allowing faculty to take a deep dive into, let's say I wanna really look at my include behaviors. Um, so faculty can ask for intensive feedback in one or a few categories, but they can also get a holistic view of their teaching across categories as well. Um, typically we encourage observers to give feedback that highlights categories for strength as well as potential categories for growth and expansion in terms of teaching practice. Um, so we've gotten a lot of really good feedback. The other thing that this observation protocol does is it incorporates the instructor's voice. So it asks the instructor to provide reflections on the class period or modules that were observed. And <clears throat> those are provided to the observer as they write their report. So you're not just going on what you see happening either in an online space or in a physical classroom space, you also get to hear from the instructor to um, understand better what it is that went into the planning of the session, or if a particular moment happened in the class period, an instructor might choose to reflect on that a little bit more in depth. Uh, I've found when conducting these observations, it really allows me to get a much more 360 view of the instructor and to provide feedback in more areas than I would with a traditional observation protocol. And just adding on to that, we've also worked with a few um, faculty and also educational developers at other institutions who have adapted and adopted the CTB framework for observations primarily. The interesting thing there is they didn't adapt it exactly as we had published it. Mm -hmm. But that I think was one of our intentions, that we wanted to provide a framework to open conversations. And so at least one of the teams that worked with the tool from University of California Fullerton, they spent a whole year looking at the different categories, looking at the tool and thinking about how they might implement it. And we feel that is really one of the, we feel accomplished because it really, it started the conversations and sustained it and allowed faculty to really engage with those ideas around evidence-based instructional practices. And maybe that's exactly what we need, right? That people take ownership of, uh, yes. of, of your materials, right? Because that's when you get the best implementation. Um, and also, if I'm not mistaken, you include the protocols in your book, right? So there, there, there is an observation protocol suggested to uh, the readers. 
So we um, provide a protocol. One of the chapters is on peer observation and another is on student feedback. Mm -hmm. And each of those chapters provides research on why we should be doing this and what the value is, but it also provides sort of step-by-step -step instructions on how do you do this to get the maximum benefit out of it? And how do you do this using the, the instruments that we've created? Um, so I did want to add, Eric, you, you said, you know, maybe the goal is not to have just one way of doing it, but multiple ways. We have Creative Commons licensed all of the instruments that we've created except the framework itself with the goal of allowing people to adapt this to their institutional context as needed. Uh, what we do ask is that people share what they develop with us so that we can then post it to our website under an adaptations tab with the idea that we're sort of communally generating ways of doing things. It's all based around this same framework providing a language and a foundation for us to do this kind of work. So we're helping each other as we generate these instruments because we've each done something that fits our institutional context and we can learn together what works and how to improve. So now that your book is out, the um... And having published books myself, I, I know that this is uh, sort of what happens once once a book gets published. It, it lives in lives of its own, right? I mean, it's out there and um, and it's out of your hands, not just the book, but the materials in the book. Mm -hmm. So if we forward the clock 10 years, what are your hopes for the book and your framework how, how do you hope the cdb framework will have impacted the way we talk about teaching in higher education yeah and so i'm following up what what lauren just said about um faculty at different institutions cross disciplines adapting the the tools to meet their needs i think that is one of our hopes that the tools inspire conversations in many different universities institutions departments to think about what does good teaching look like and come up with a uh, transparent expectation for faculty and this is what we are this is what we mean when we say this is good teaching or this is excellent teaching in our department in our institution um, we think that the cdb framework is providing those foundations by focusing on those six big categories we know that the research on teaching continues to change and so what we talk about in details in the chapters now, the different strategies is based on research that is available to us now, but there will be new ideas that come up that allow us to think about engaging students, including students, or even assessing students in different ways that we have not yet thought about. But we hope that by providing those big categories, it really serves as a foundation on which we can grow and really, yes, build and thrive and have um, communal conversations around teaching that start on the same basis with the same premise in mind. Yeah, I think to add to what Claudia is saying, I would really want to see this project become a way we think about and approach teaching. So it's providing a foundation to talk about teaching. And so we've we've done extensive research to identify these six different categories. We didn't just say, you know, these six categories sound like they would be cool. Um, we did extensive literature reviews and sort of looked for what are the common themes that come up across the literature of um, effectiveness in student learning practices. Uh, and that's how we identified these categories. So we would hope to find in 10 years that the categories themselves still stand mm -hmm. and that we're able to add new practices to those categories as we um, encounter emerging research on teaching and learning. I think we would also hope to see this project overall shift the way we evaluate teaching so that we're not relying so much on there is that one question on the student feedback form that says, my teacher is effective, yes or no, or on a scale of one to five, they do this thing very well, and oh, you're a good teacher, or nope, you're not. Um, so we hope this project overall is going to allow faculty to document their teaching more effectively, but we're also hoping that it will allow those who are evaluating teaching to look beyond the student feedback alone to incorporate these other aspects of teaching and look at their faculty more holistically.
Yeah. And also to look beyond what is familiar to them to really look at what has been demonstrated to support teaching and learning. So you, you, you emphasize, Lauren, uh, the word alone there when talking about student uh, feedback questionnaires. Uh, I, I, I understand from that that you're not in favor of completely abolishing the student questionnaire. Am I correct? No, I, I mean, our reliance on mid-semester student feedback suggests that we wouldn't want to abolish that. I think what we would like to see is more equi equitable evaluation that includes the student voice, but also the faculty voice as well as peers. So we want to be sure that we're getting you know, more of a 360 view of what faculty are doing. And so we're not relying exclusively on student feedback, which we know based on extensive research can be biased uh, for many different reasons. That doesn't mean we throw it out necessarily, but it means that we need to temper it with all these other perspectives on teaching to make it effective. And now that the book is out, what's next for you? Well, this is the part where I get to talk about my super exciting project. So um, I love to have a project, as does Claudia. And obviously, we're passionate about critical teaching behaviors. And now that the book is out, um, I am combining that with my other passion, which is perusal. I have been wanting to bring these two things into conjunction for years, and I finally found a way to do it. Uh, Claudia and I are creating a perusal reading community where um, faculty or in fact anyone who's interested in reading the book can join and uh, be part of an author facilitated conversation. So Claudia and I are in the process of filming videos um, to add more content to that course. So it's not just going to be uh, reading the book together, but um, there will be videos as well. Um, but there will also be conversation through perusal where faculty can talk to each other across institutions. And they're also talking to us. So we'll be in there actively participating. Uh, we're really excited about this project. So excited that we actually submitted a perusal exchange proposal already to talk about social learning for faculty through perusal platforms. So if you're not able to join us for this first iteration, which begins May 1st, and runs until the end of May. I hope that folks who are listening might consider uh, watching our perusal exchange presentation where we talk about how that community went and um, any plans for future iterations based on how this, uh, this initial run goes. Well, that's absolutely wonderful. And I, I'm going to say a little bit more about that uh, as we wrap up here. I just have one final question, which I like to uh, end most of my podcasts with is, if there's one thing you could tell our listeners that they should implement or that they could start implementing tomorrow, so to speak, what would that be? That's a great question. I, I am think, a tough question. Yeah, but I think whatever it is, and I think that was really also one of the driving forces it has to be something that resonates with them, right? There can be all these wonderful ideas out there for you can engage your students in that way. You can have um, assessments that are exams or projects or um, recently you talked about the non-replaceable assignments on your podcast. So you can have all of these ideas, but in the end, Whatever you adopt or whatever you do, it, it has to be something that resonates with you. I think we're all in a place where we are in, incredibly um, at the limit of what we have capacity to do. And so whatever it is, we probably want to start small and we want to make it something that brings us joy in addition to so, supporting our student learning. Not surprisingly, since Claudia and I have worked together so long, I had a very similar response, which was going to... Um, sort of center around the word align, align your teaching. So if there's one thing that faculty could do right now, I would recommend, um, I think it's chapter seven of the book, it's on finding your core value. And the idea is that you sit down and you reflect on who you are as a teacher and why you do the things that you do. If you can figure out what your core value is, then you can figure out the sorts of behaviors that you want to implement as well as the why so that you're not just going out saying like, ooh, ungrading sounds like a really cool thing. I want to do that. 
Not that there's anything wrong with that. We know that ungrading can be very effective, but does it align with who you are as an instructor and what you want to accomplish in your classroom? So for me, I'll echo what Claudia said and say, it's all about alignment and finding out who you are as an instructor before you choose your classroom behaviors. I love that alignment and what a great way to end this uh, podcast. So thank you all for listening and thank you especially to our guests, Dr. Lauren Barbeau and Dr. Claudia Conejo Happel. So congratulations on your new book and here's to hoping that the CTB framework will actually impact how we think about teaching and will transform institutions to really start a, in a sense of scholarship about uh, teaching. Now, I mentioned the surprise at the beginning of this podcast. If you fast forward to the end, um, we already spoke about it in the middle of the podcast, but I am really excited to announce that Perusal and Stylus Publishing, the publisher of Lauren and Claudia's book, will co-organize a four-week long collective asynchronous reading of their book and as Lauren said, this is going to begin on May 1st and run for four weeks. During this event, you can peruse Lauren and Claudia's book and asynchronously interact with other readers and most importantly, with them. And I'm really excited to know that they're already taping additional materials that they will make available in that um, perusal event. You will learn about evidence-based practices to help you identify good teaching and obtain guidance on how to capture and present teaching accomplishment and be able to connect and interact not only with them, but also with other like-minded individuals. If you want of people interested in assessing and guiding good teaching practices. Another exciting bit of news you heard too, Lauren and Claudia will be giving a talk at the CES Perusal Exchange. Um, so if you haven't registered yet for this year's exciting Perusal Exchange, go to perusal.com slash exchange 2023. It will start on June 5th and run through June 11th. I hope that I will see many of you listeners and of course, Lauren and Claudia at the exchange uh, this year. You can find our podcast and more on perusal.com slash social learning amplified. Subscribe to join us and see you on our next episode. Social Learning Amplified is sponsored by Perusal, the social learning platform that motivates students by increasing engagement, driving collaboration, and building community through your favorite course content. To learn more, join us at one of our introductory webinars. Visit perusal.com to learn more and register.